and, and the problems that I see facing us. You know, we're going into a really bad economic period. Wayne Fraser talked a little bit about it last night, about the loss of manufacturing jobs. You know, in the last five years alone, we lost 205,000 jobs. That's almost the equivalent in five years of losing every single QP member in the province. Could you fathom that? Could you imagine every QP member losing their job? That's what's happened in the manufacturing sector. And we'd be absolutely daft if we didn't think that's going to have an impact and a trickle-down effect into QP. I spoke to some of the brothers last night from Windsor. And some locals are talking about three, three, and three, in the, and, and we are talking about that in the school board sector, actually, in a central agreement. And the brothers from Windsor said, we're in serious trouble down here, Sid. We're in deep, deep trouble, and we need some assistance from QP from a research standpoint. We maybe have to start thinking about cost of living allowances. We have to get creative because the auto industry is flat on its back, and all of the feeder plants are flat on their back, and all of the other industries are taking zeros in the Windsor area. And the local is obviously feeling the pressure because you know what's going to happen. You know the politicians are going to say the tax base has been eroded. We don't have money for wage increases. Now, that's just one little microcosm of what's happening in one area. And it's been replicated all across Ontario. And it's almost reminiscent of what happened at the dawning of the, in the, of the industrial age in many respects. Richard Florida, a policy specialist at the University of Toronto, um, likens it to the turn of the century when we had this massive income disparity and this polarization taking place between the classes and how the whole world was changing with the advent of the industrial age, people flocking off the farms into the cities, into the industrialized places. There were fights, and, I know, and those who are students of, of labor history uh, will recall there were many, many fights. I know in the city where I was born in Dublin, in 1913, and I'm not that old, Fred, I wasn't around then. <laughs> but, uh, but in 1913, I can tell you, um, there was massive unrest. 100,000 dockers were out on strike. Tuberculosis was rampant through the city. People were living in tenement houses. Fights with the bosses over sharing the wealth. You know, Richard Florida says it took actually 50 years and two world wars to sort out the economic mess, to make sure that we had some degree of equalization where people began to participate in the economic wealth that was being created by the industrial age. And some folks, and Richard Florida being one of them, are saying that we're actually going into that type of a period again. We're actually now beginning to see some very, very low paid workers in the service sector and some very, very high paying jobs in the manufacturing sector disappearing at alarming rates. And then who's squeezed in the middle? It's QP with middle income jobs basically and, and public sector. And you know the squeeze is going to happen. You know once that tax base goes, and you know once this very, very low wage economy, combined with globalization where they're shipping everything, you cannot buy anything these days unless it comes in from China. You know that's a recipe for social unrest. You know that's why they start, when they start pumping money into the military, you start to wonder what the hell's going on here. And you start to see in the United States, three or four trillion dollars in debt and they're still pumping $500 billion into Iraq, the buildup of the military. When you see a $14 billion surplus here in Canada, and not a penny of it went towards social programs, not a penny. And then, and then Harper has a press conference just a little while ago, and he talks about how over the next 20 years we're going to pump in $100 billion into the buildup of, of weaponry and the army. And there's, peop and there's people losing their jobs. That's, that's what we're faced with, sisters and brothers. That's the economic climate we're going into. And we'd be foolhardy if we didn't start to change the way we do business in CUPE. And that's why I want to connect the dots for you a little bit. The dots I want to connect are those fights we had in the floor of this convention a couple of years ago. When we talked about we wanted full-time coordinators, there was logic behind that, sisters and brothers. That just wasn't about give us more staff in Ontario. That was logic. We were saying we need to change the way we negotiate, sisters and brothers. We need to be able to say, like I did earlier on, we get the collective strength of 50,000 school board workers, or the collective strength, for example, of the ACL workers, or the collective strength of the hospital workers, and we go to those governments and we put it to them. 
because I cannot see a system when it's going in on an individual basis. We tried this, and I'll give you an example, Victoria Daycare, because I want to come to the challenges in CUPE, and it's the PSWs in the home care field, sisters and brothers, and it's child care workers. They're, that's where the challenges are, I see, in our union. And if we can fix it for them, we can fix it for everybody in the province. But we ought to be, be able to do it in a way that's different. Victoria Daycare, we went in, we tried to fight them on, a, on an individual basis. We said we wanted a pension plan for the Victoria Daycare workers. What did they do? They closed their doors. They put all of our members out of work. They put all of our members. But there's a way around that. There's a way around that. Because everybody was scurrying away. Nobody wanted to take responsibility. Mel Lastman said it wasn't his responsibility. Mike Harris at the time said it wasn't his responsibility. We couldn't find a level of government that would take responsibility. But I'll tell you how you had force them to take responsibility. We got to organize all those childcare workers across Ontario into one massive voting block, sisters and brothers, a bargaining block where we give us the researchers, give us the, re the full time coordinator, give us the organizers, and we'll put it together. We know how to do it. We've already done it with a few sectors already. PSWs, you know. If you ever want to be reinvigorated as a trade unionist, I recommend that you go down and visit local 4308. Go down to Kelly O'Sullivan's local. I was down there the other night. I had the distinct pleasure of walking in to what I believe to be the revitalization of the labor movement. I walked into a room, and all I could see was this magnificent diversity. She was having a little celebration for an uh, organizing drive that he'd, uh, that he'd, in a representation vote that he'd won. They got 400 members. And to sit and listen to what they had to say, sisters and brothers, was something else. Honestly, um, just to give you a little sense of the dialogue, you know, a sister shouts out from the back of the hall, hey, Kelly, you know, what's going to happen? Because they're all going into bargaining now, and they're all excited that you've got this bigger bargaining unit. They're going in to negotiate. And this sister says at the back of the hall, hey, Kelly, what can you do for us? When we go out the door, what do we get? And a sister from the front shouts out, the, the employer says to you, don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out because we don't have a pension plan. They don't have a pension plan. There was a sister sitting there almost crying saying, will this now mean that when I go to visit a client that the money I put into the parking meter, may, will I get reimbursed for that? Do you know in the home care sector that most PSWs, when they drive their cars, they pay for their own gas? Can you imagine with today's prices of gas? Do you have to pay for it themselves? Do you know what they earn, sisters and brothers? Some of them less than 10 bucks an hour? You know, if you join QP, and you're earning 10 or 11 dollars an hour and you don't have a pension plan and you don't have a benefits what's the point in be belonging to the biggest trade union in the country if you cannot say we can organize around those workers sisters and brothers can't we do that surely the goodness this has got to be the challenge of this union we said a few years ago a year ago that we want everybody to have 15 bucks an hour on a pension plan by the year 215. are we working in that plan yet i don't think we are where is the full-time coordinator for PSWs? Where is the researchers for PSWs? Where is the resources for the PSWs? That's what the fight is about, sisters and brothers. And that's why I say to the national officers, and I say to anybody on the floor who thinks we're just willy-nilly fighting with the national, we're not. There's a purpose behind the fight, sisters and brothers. We're saying we're closest to the problem. We're on the ground in Ontario. We know what needs to be done. And we want the institutional resistance to stop. We want it to stop because we found the way, we've demonstrated it with school boards and we've demonstrated it with ACLs that we know what we're talking about. And I just know with the staff in this province, with the ingenuity that they've got, with the expertise that they've got, with the seniority that they've got, that our expertise can be brought to bear on this problem. We just need to remove the institutional resistance.